there's a lot of benefit from it. So, um, again, introducing myself, I'm Jennifer, I'm a counseling psychologist, and my guest today or know the therapist is Gladwell Limbali. So, Gladwell, it's your platform, Karibu Sana. How has your day been? Thank you. Thank you for the invite. My day has been busy, very busy. But all the same, I was looking forward to this. So, um, I feel more relaxed. I'm back home. And I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Awesome. That's mm-hmm. good to hear. Um, let's start with you telling us a little bit about yourself as a, uh, mm-hmm. being a counseling psychologist. What, what, what does it mean to be a counseling psychologist and um, how long you've been practicing? I think that would be a good place to start. Okay. First of all, you've heard many times, my name is Gladwell Imbali. I'm a counseling psychologist. I've been practicing since, um, since I graduated from my BA and that would be 2013-2014. That's how long I've been practicing. Of course, things got a bit busy and and now I can, I can comfortably say I am practicing. If you had asked me this question in 2013 or 2014, I don't know what answer I would have given. So it's been a journey of growth and so many other things, discovery, getting to know a lot of things about myself and about the people that I counsel, the people that I counsel. Yeah, I'm very curious about what you've just said, that if I had asked this question in 2013, 2014, I would have gotten a different answer. Would you like to give us a little bit of background on that? We love, we love details on this channel. Just tell us. <laughs> I don't know. If you were to ask me for how long have you been practicing, the first thing I would have asked myself, uh, am I practicing? Because at that point in time, it's just after graduation and, and you've gotten something to do. I had actually just gotten a, a, a job which was neither here nor there. Mm. So, and because I probably my answer would have been different because of experience. You know? Because once you've graduated, sometimes you're doing things and you're not very sure if you're doing the right thing or not. And so the word practicing sounds really like a big, big word. Something that someone needs to be saying when they have they have worked for a long time, and so I, I don't think that would be a totally different. It would be a totally different. <laughs> wow, that is that is so that is so amazing to hear because uh, you've just said something that could take us in so many different tangents. But mm-hmm. it's amazing to hear a counselor say something like that because um, I, I think that is something that very many new therapists struggle with when they're just starting out in the field. You don't know how long you should have practiced for you to consider yourself a, 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 a counselor, like a therapist. If somebody asks you how long have you been practicing, you don't have an answer really. Because you're thinking, mm-hmm. is one year too little time? Is six months too little time? And I remember I also struggled with that. And I think for me, um, I, I, I say I struggled with that because even when I was in practicum, when I was not supposed to be struggling with such a question, I still mm-hmm. thought that I was not yet a counselor. I was like, I can't, I can't be, I can't be like, I know I'm seeing real clients. I know I'm mm-hmm. handling real issues and we're talking mm-hmm. about real things happening in their lives. But I, I don't think I should call myself that. So for you, when did, did it become clear that you are actually a counselor and that was actually a thing? You will be actually surprised uh-huh. when this became very clear to me because um, it was actually very recent, as recent as 2020. While mm. I had practiced Yes, I had practiced for those many years, but still, I, I used to second guess myself. I would shy away from certain kind of clients. Uh, I, I would prefer, I just had my own way of choosing whomever I wanted to see. But then in 2020, it's the time that I got real experience in the sense that I, I got to see a multitude of clients and even when i was starting in that place when i was where i was employed uh, i still wasn't very sure about myself but then three months down the line it's that's the point where i knew i am doing what i need to be doing i kept on feeling i'm doing the right thing not necessarily the right thing but i kept on feeling like i am this impact while i know at the past there was impact still but i i wasn't so confident about myself and I think just like any other profession, once when you're just beginning, there's that aspect of um, 
confidence is for some people not everyone confidence you don't have so much confidence and experience gives you confidence and so for me 2020 was the 20 early 2020 was the year and again because of covid as well was a lot of uh, mental cases up during that season and i got to meet a lot of people like i i, I if i used to have a book that i would um record my clients and i noticed for the time that i had worked in that specific place i had seen almost 400 clients and so i it literally boost my confidence and and I, i had so much confidence that i knew i can apply for a job anywhere confidently and i would be able to perform oh wow that is amazing um um <laughs> what uh, what what was the biggest fear during that time that you uh, you, you said from 2013 2014 up to 2020 that's that's a, a, a good long period of time. long time what yeah what was the what was the biggest fear then you mentioned confidence but i'm wondering what what was it that made you think i'm not yet i'm not yet there i'm not i i can't be honestly i don't know because even during that period is on and off on and off it's not like i was consistent for that period of time mm. and so I I tended to to see very specific okay not me so specific very yeah let me say very specific kind of clients and yeah. and the number of clients so was really very few like in a week I would in a week I would count like one or two two clients I've seen mm. for that long you know and 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 that I think for me it kind of just made me feel like I am not ready I am not ready because uh what one thing that happened to me is um while I was practicing most of the my practices were literally pro bono and wow. I would volunteer work in organizations I would go to places and do my practices and so it's not like I was literally employed and so I had the choice of deciding on to be a client or C2 and so when I got employed now I get hands on I had to get that experience of seeing so many clients and I think that my confidence came in for me it's majorly just the fact that I was seeing very few people and I had not acted with a diverse diverse is mentally and from my from the place where I was employed I interacted with diverse issues psychological and mental so I think that period is where I got my confidence because just by the fact that I had dealt with I yeah mm-hmm. Oh that's amazing. That's mm-hmm. that's really that's really good to hear and I think it's also quite um liberating for any counselor who might be listening right now and they're thinking um am I am I a counselor am I not a counselor do how long does it take that that is a very really liberating story mm-hmm. and I am really grateful that you've been able to share it with us with us because not many people are willing to open up about such kind of things and especially mm-hmm. in our field for some reason mm-hmm. in the, in the in the mental health profession struggling yeah. is seen as a taboo thing it's like you're not supposed to talk about your struggles why do you think yeah. that honestly i don't know I, 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 over the years i have come to personally i've also struggled i have just faced mm-hmm. something right now but there are issues i also struggled being a mental health pr- practitioner it's like um it's like what you know the way people look up to you they look at you as a strong person you're the one who's supposed to be giving uh, services or supposed to be helping and when now you you talk about your weaknesses or just the kind of struggles you're going through it may not be that the other person is seeing you the way you see yourself you 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 actually can you we become very hard on ourselves I probably that's what the word I should use on myself become very hard on yourself to the and uh, to the point that you don't seek help you don't want to show vulnerability you don't want to show that you're struggling at any point you want to appear as this strong person and everyone will always you will always be giving 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 and maybe you're not getting anything and for me that is one thing that I got to learn much later that when you give 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 and you're not getting resentment can actually set in you can resent your work you can resent the people you're giving uh, your side and so it's really i have been liberated in that area i know how to speak about my weaknesses i to do self disclosure when i have to 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 talk about what's happening in my life so that i can i can also be seen as a yeah not just yeah. a person who knows how to fix but doesn't ever go through uh, experiences 
Yeah, yeah. I think that's quite important, um, especially what you've just said about knowing when to self-disclose and knowing how to show yourself as a human being. Because I think also it's very possible for people mm -hmm. in our field to be put on a pedestal. So people will think um, this person is perfect. And I think also the fact that people have very high expectations of people in the mm -hmm. mental health field. And this is not even strangers. It's people even within the family. Mm -hmm. They don't expect you to get angry and stay angry or not mm -hmm. to have your anger under control. They don't mm -hmm. expect you to not forgive quickly. They don't expect mm -hmm. you not to understand things, you know. So there's yeah. a lot of expectation. And being able to, and, and those expectations can, first of all, they, if they go to your head, they can leave you thinking, oh, I'm actually, oh, wow, yes, I am that person. And then mm -hmm. that, that actually limits your, uh, your capacity to open up, to be vulnerable and to create intimate relationships because you're, you're, you're removed. You're very far removed from reality and humanity. You're like this mm -hmm. God, you know. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and for, for the people who are trying to idealize you, they're thinking, oh my gosh, this person is so perfect. And if you ever show your struggle, they're like, what do you mean you're struggling? When is your yeah. mental health professional? How can you be struggling? Uh, you know these yeah. things. Speak it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> what about therapy to yourself? Why can't you treat yourself from all these things? <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. You're treated like a small god, but all the same... Now we know better. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now we know better. And I think, um, yeah. I think for me, for me, the, uh, the, that 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 realization of always knowing better came especially in the in the 2020-2021 period when counselors were seeing so many people who uh, during the COVID period. So people mm -hmm. are struggling with many things in COVID period. People are not just mm -hmm. struggling with the fear of the disease mm -hmm. and, and and having to deal with also the changing. Uh, ways of being. You can't walk around without a mask. You can't see people yeah. clearly. You can't really. You don't know if people are laughing with you or laughing at you or laughing at all. There was a lot of confusion, and then oh, yeah. they have their own mental illness, and then they're struggling with finances. And families are in mm -hmm. one place under the same roof, twenty four hours a day. There was a lot mm -hmm. to struggle with, and then as a therapist, you yeah. are struggling with all those things, and then now you have to see people. Exactly. And, and there's no nobody <laughs> prepared you. Nobody yeah. prepared you for anything. You're trying to go and do therapy online and nobody prepared mm. you for virtual therapy. You are prepared to and you're, like Freud. That's all you know. <laughs> you're, going, you're going through the exact same things they are going through, but you you yeah. need to you expected to be the strong one and, and help them through that season. You know? Yeah. yeah. That was that was that was actually the time that I realized that really mental health professionals need to always, always kick down that pedestal that people have put you on. Like, like dismantle it. Dismantle it. Show them your humanity. Constantly show that you're a human being so that people don't idealize you. And I think that's a, that's a very important message. And thank you for sharing, for sharing that and taking us on that side of the conversation. That's really, really helpful. Um, now, you've mentioned something about, about um, when you were practicing uh, during that time and, and before you started with this other place. You were seeing a very narrow... Um, clientele, like the, the the demographic was very narrow. Um, when you started diversifying, first of all, what clientele was was that that you were seeing that was very narrow? And when you started diversifying, what mm. kind of people do you see now? And where where what exactly do you work with? Who which populations? Okay, then uh, for me, narrow is in the sense of uh, not not um, okay. Narrow in the sense of. I was seeing people who were working organization. And so I would sometimes see clients and sometimes not. So like in a day, I would find myself like I've gone to work and I've just seen like one person and that would be it. And so probably they'll just prevent, they present with things like social issues, maybe marital, marital related parenting issues. And so uh, that's, that's how my days were, you know. So I got to diversify and I started dealing with a lot more in terms of even gender, in terms of age. Oh, not to mention that in my other, this other, uh, the other place, I was also dealing with mainly ladies, mainly women. And so when I, I, I started meeting this diverse population, it was a wide variety. I would see, um, I would see adolescents, people from 11 years to probably 17, I would see older people from 70 years. I would see young adults from 23 to 27 years old. I would see uh, at all gender, 
know, from different professionals. And, and they would come up with, uh, they will come with a lot, a lot of things, you know, you know, the kind of issues adolescents will face definitely are different from the issues a 75 year old person would face, the issues a 23 year old would face. And so that's how I, I diversified. And again, even during that period, uh, one thing that I actually have, have confidence about in my practice is dealing with people or with drug and substance abuse, especially alcohol addiction. Because during that period, that's the population that I worked with a lot. Despite working with other mental illnesses uh, during that period, I, my, I, I somehow found myself working with people who were struggling with alcohol and substance abuse. And so that's, I mean, plus all these other mental illnesses. Actually, where I was working was a hospital. And so in hospital, clearly you can see you meet all sorts of mental illnesses, social problems, you know, adolescent related problems, uh, problems, uh, old age problems, you know, people struggling with um, retirement uh, illnesses during old age. So those are lots to work with. And so from there, I, I, that's where the diversity, I, I, it, it broadened my, my, my mind to mental illnesses and mental health issues. That's that's uh, that's fantastic. So, um, do you right now, as as uh, as you do the work that you do, do you um, see what what populations do you work with? If if they were listening right now, who who would be the ideal client that comes to see you? What would they be looking for? Um, I am passionate about um, the adolescent between uh, fifteen, not fifteen, twelve to seventeen years old, eighteen. There, that's that's where my passion is. But I do not just see adolescents. I am open to any any type of client, in terms of age, in terms of um, in terms of what, yeah, age and whatever issue they bring to the table, I am okay with that. But that's where my passion is, and that's that's my first passion when it comes to populations. But also, I am also very very passionate about drug and substance use. Because I think that is very close to me, for me, and, and, and I feel unconsciously, even when I was working at the place I was working, unconsciously, I always wanted to pick clients who were struggling with alcohol and substance. Yeah, later on, I came to find out why, because that those were my clients, and if you'd ask anyone in that institution, okay, there's this client who's coming, they are suffering from this, this, and this, they have these drug issues, and they'll go, glad we'll see that one, because that's what I enjoyed doing. And so I'm really, in terms of age, I can't, I probably I'm still a jack of all trades. I have not specified, but I know what I really love doing. And, and that's what I do. I, I, that's where I am, actually. I cannot tell you that I have one specific population that I enjoy working with or I would really prefer, but I know my passion. I know where my passion is. Yeah, um, that's, mm. that's good to hear. Um, it's something that I've noticed with... Um, Many, many of the of the people who have gone to school to study counseling psychology, mm. I like the fact that our degree give us, gives us that vers versatility. You don't mm. have to, I have realized that with our degree, you don't have to specifically say that I have specialized in this one thing. Because mm -hmm. you literally do, you counsel everyone as long yeah. as they have an issue that you know how to do. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's also good to recognize where your passion lies because mm -hmm. as much as you might not end up specializing you will mm -hmm. always find the things that you gravitate towards so yeah. um i think it's important and this is also a good message for anybody who's studying to be a casting psychologist i think that's one of the big benefits of the degree it allows you to um to work with diverse populations to work mm -hmm. with diverse mental illnesses to work mm -hmm. with diverse issues and it makes it makes your work broader of course yeah. at the end of the day being a generalist versus being a specialist that is um that is that is a conversation that will go on has started started from way back and will go on forever you have yeah. to pick the best thing for your career nobody mm -hmm. can tell you you have to generalize or you mm -hmm. have to specialize that is mm -hmm. a personal uh, decision yeah. so thank you gladwell for sharing where you are and, and so that in case anybody is listening they know what to expect when they come to see you so yeah. thank you very much um before we even proceed, give me a minute to say hi to our audience today. I can mm -hmm. see Lucy and Joy is here. Hi, Lucy. Uh, F. Alukwe is here. And uh, Miss Wako is here with us. 
and Caroline Mukura. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for coming through. Uh, Lucy Wanjohi says, I wish many psychologists, therapists, and counselors remember they are human first before their occupation. Before human means we are not perfect and we will stop will still go through life challenges. Yes, that is very true, Lucy. That is exactly what we were saying. That is a fantastic addition. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so, shifting gears a little bit. Actually, not shifting gears. This one, we're still on the same gear. Which mm -hmm. is, you mentioned that you, 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 started practice, uh, you started practicing from your undergraduate, yeah, after graduating undergraduate in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit of the training that you have in the work that you do? Uh, whatever courses you've taken, and how you've gotten to this point wow it's been a long journey really a very long journey my initial training was not even in counseling psychology when i finished high school i studied as um, a course in hotel management hotel management a, a whole three year of course when I went for my practicum after that, I just realized I didn't want to do that. While I love cooking, I love things, hotel, I didn't want to work in the hotel industry. So I was looking for a way to run away from hotel industry. Then I went and studied education. Those are many years ago. We used to have a, a, an institution called Kenya Technical Teachers College. It was a college. So when you go there after a diploma course, you are supposed to study to teach the course that you learned in your three years course. So I went and studied higher diploma in education in brackets. There was a bracket there, nutrition. So I wanted to be a teacher <laughs> in foods and nutrition. While in that college, there was this course that was called education psychology. And this is one thing that I really enjoyed attending. Like that was my best, you know, my best course. So after graduating, I was just there thinking, okay, what next? You know, I was born in that era where your parent decides what you need to do. Like even me doing hotel management was not out of my choice. It just happened. There's a, there's a letter, there's this college, you're going. And so after my graduation, I, 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 I stayed home for a bit thinking, what do I need? Do I need to teach? Do I need to do something else? I knew for sure that I needed to further my education to something. But then having taken a course of education, I was not sure what to do. And now I, I'm, I am one of those who joined the university much later, not immediately after high school. So when I was going through um, courses that I'd love to do, I actually had never thought of psychology. So I was going to enroll and study my, my undergraduate then. And then I just saw counseling psychology. And I, I did not look back. I just remembered my education psychology course back in the, my teaching college. And I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. And when I, I do an, a retrospect and think about how it's been, I just realized how much I actually wanted to be in the service, some, some sort of profession that deals with people, that gives some sort of help, you know? Yeah, I was given this hotel, hotel, what sometimes parents can choose for you a course, but also sometimes it's because they know you, what kind of person you are. So in the hotel industry, you know, that's hospitality. It is service, service to the people. You'll be dealing with people like literally either cooking for them or serving for them or just doing something for people. When I went for education, it's exactly the same thing. You know, education is just one of those courses that you're actually literally just impacting knowledge always wanting to do something to improve someone else's life. And so, and not to mention that this to initially I had always wanted to work as a nurse. I am, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a clean, very a clean. And so I used to see nurses with those white clothes and I'm like, that's how clean I just want to be looking like then. And so that's when I started, I, I started now uh, counseling psychology undergraduate. And then when I finished that, I stayed home a little bit, took care of my little ones, and then I went back and did my master's. So that's how long the journey has been. I'm one of those people who have studied for a very long time. I remember one day my sister told me, ah, you have really studied. Like, if there's anyone who's gone to school for many years, it's you. <laughs> but I had to work. I always feel like there's no age limit when you can change your career to something that you love. And so for me, that was it.
Wow, that's that's an amazing journey. That's really really an amazing journey. And and hearing that um reminds me of people who keep saying uh I I met somebody who told me that she cannot go back to school at this time. She's too old. And I was mm-hmm. like, what do you mean? There's there's nothing like too old. You can always go back to school. They're literally open every single day. You can go back to school whenever. You don't have to you can't you can't put that limit on yourself that you're too old mm-hmm. to go back to school and get the degree you actually like. I'm really impressed by your journey. That is um if that thing perseverance was a person then it would be you because that's oh yeah a lot of, that's a lot of years in formal education <laughs> a lot of years a lot that is a lot of years i was so determined and when i started my masters up, i am going all the way like it i will definitely get there So so you're on the journey to a PhD right now have you enrolled have you started or is it something in the works not yet it's not still yet. just there. I know I've yeah. not given up but I know I'm headed there yeah that's mm-hmm. amazing that's amazing um uh, congratulations for such a long journey uh, to get to <laughs> where you are right now and um I think that perseverance is really uh, it's 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 um it's a blessing because mm-hmm. nobody gets to get the thing they want by not persevering i don't think yeah, yeah. i don't i don't think anything worth having can be had without perseverance you have to oh yeah you have to go through mm-hmm. things for you to get to the things that you actually want and i may can relate to most of most of what you say especially about not going to school immediately after high school um going to joining campus immediately after high school that is something i can relate to and i think mm-hmm. it's a, it's an important story that people need to hear you just because you do not follow the conventional path towards higher education does not mean mm-hmm. that your doors are closed that just means that your journey will look a bit different but it does not mm-hmm. mean that your doors are closed at all so thank you so much for sharing mm-hmm. that um uh in in uh during during that time uh in the in studying all those things that's a lot of things to study again and i can see how they are connected of course for what you said what what was the and and this is specifically when you were doing your undergraduate in counseling psychology and your masters in counseling psychology what was the um, what was the thing that you learned the most th- that was surprising or liberating or um interesting that you discovered about yourself during this entire journey of especially being in a counseling class because i think being in a counseling class really changes you you don't go in and come out to the same person you are unless you're really going there just for the degree but if as long as you're going there for for the for the education and for the things that happen behind the scenes it really changes you so for you what did you discover about yourself that was very surprising or that was that actually confirmed something you already knew about yourself what was the discovery for you well there was a lot i think there's a lot of self and awareness also i, I mean a, a counseling class just it's almost like you in a therapy session and and I remember even diagnosing myself with certain mental illnesses and but the main thing that I I actually got to know about myself let's just say it was literally self awareness there's so much that I was doing there's so much that I was that I had never given thought of there's so much that I could hear people say about me and and I'd never even had a minute to think about them but being in a counseling class helped me understand so much in terms of how i behave how i do things i i sort of just started psychoanalyzing myself and it could, could it be possible that i behave like this because of this and this you know so self awareness was good for me and one thing one specific thing if i was to be specific uh, i grew up a very a very shy girl and 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 i had just come to accept that i am shy you know just giving myself that label I'm an introvert that's what I would say an introvert right I, I would hardly talk to people I kept to myself not because of anything specific but I just couldn't get out and and and, and interact with people and even make friendships I had very few friendships around me and when being in a counseling class actually made me understand that it was not just about being shy but I also had anxiety issues I would get really really anxious If I'm supposed to meet a group of people that I don't know, I'll get so much anxiety. 
And sometimes it would prevent me from doing that. If I was supposed to stand in front of people and make a presentation, actually, I struggled with that even at the university because, you know, university, we do research, we present. And I was one of those people who would say, okay, let me do the research, I'll do everything. But then I'm not presenting. So that was me. And over the years, I was like, why, why is it that I cannot, I know it, I have the knowledge, I have done the research. If anything, I'm the best person to present. Why can't I do it? So I just realized that I struggled a lot with anxiety issues. And that's, that was one big discovery. And all for, for those who are counselors and many people we know that anxiety is just something that, something to do with your cognitions, the way you, 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 how you think, you know, you interpret things in totally different ways. And over this, I have already known that I know this problem and I work towards it. Right now, there are people, if you ask them about me, they think I am the most confident person in this world. And it's just that they don't know my story and where the confidence came from. It's just from self-awareness and just the fact that I got to know that I struggled with anxiety. Um, that is that is an amazing, or, or, um, what do you call it, revelation. Because mm -hmm. as you said, uh, meeting you, nobody will sit there and think, oh, glad we must be struggling with anxiety. You, you're one of the most confident people I know. And I've met you in person, of course. And you, you sound like you very confident and everything but i also can relate to that because um, again uh, i think anxiety being one of the most common uh, mental illnesses in the world right now it's rare to walk around it's not rare but it's it's many people that you're going to meet who have um, anxiety when it comes mm -hmm. to mental struggles and um I, I i i can i can totally empathize with that because um you it can i can imagine how limiting it feels sometimes you know mm -hmm. that you have whatever you know you have all the inner strength that you need to do things but mm -hmm. then it feels like your your own psyche is fighting you to put mm -hmm. you down it's like it's mm -hmm. your number one enemy and you're thinking why are you not supposed to be on my side you're my psyche you're supposed to be on my side <laughs> that's very confusing <laughs> it can be it can be very confusing so uh, thank you for sharing that I'm, I'm i'm very curious if you because some people say uh, some people don't know if that mental health professionals also struggle with mental illnesses and not necessarily like the disorders that have been diagnosed and you know the big ones in the dsm and everything is sometimes it's usually low, low, low level struggles so i'm curious if for you mm -hmm. you've had any other than anxiety other other mental challenges you've had in your life and if that is something that you're comfortable sharing with the audience Honestly, I don't think of there's any other. For me, my biggest challenge, and I don't even, I, I, I wouldn't say that uh, my anxiety would even fit the criteria for anxiety as a mental, um, as a mental illness. It's just that anxiety that I, I, I realized. <laughs> I remember even at one point I needed, I had to look up at the criteria for anxiety to see, do I fit this criteria? I know that I didn't get to, I don't get to fit there. So I do not even mean to say uh, that I have a mental anxiety as a disorder, but I'm generally a very anxious person. I overthink. One of our friends keeps telling me, the problem with you is that you overthink. You just, just do it. Like if you're planning to do something, just do it. You know, why do you have to think so much? Why do you, and when I'm thinking that way, I'm not thinking about anything positive. I'm always thinking of the worst case scenario. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if I get an accident? What if, you know, so then I get so anxious. And because of that, I, I'm, I'm unable to take the next step forward. And so for me, I would say that has been the main thing. And more so, it's, I would probably say it as a generalized anxiety sort of thing. Not Because it's not only in one area. I would struggle with sometimes social interactions and I would avoid a certain road and I will avoid some people I would want to because I'm already asking myself, so what if I sit in that conversation and then I say something down, you know, you know, and then if I, if I find myself in a group of people and then I, I keep replaying the conversation later and I'm picking all the wrong things that I might have said in that conversation. Yeah, so that's that's the kind of anxiety that I have struggled with. I'm telling you, Jennifer, it's something that I do not even think about now. I do not even care. Like if I have a conversation with you and you think, oh, what is that? For me, I have moved on. It's, it doesn't bother me anymore because now I am aware of it and I'm, I know how to deal with it and I know people make mistakes. I mean, we, we say dumb things sometimes and, and we need to move on. You can't dwell, you can't ruminate over that thing that you've just done. 
So I, I, I mean, psychology was literally designed for me. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can totally relate to a lot of what you're saying because, again, it's that thing where, when, when you say that people are struggling with anxiety, sometimes it's not usually when that it's a disorder they've been diagnosed. Now they have, they have to go on medication and all those things. Most of the times, mm-hmm. it's something that is always low lying. It is just mm-hmm. below the surface. And they mm-hmm. know that they have it, that they struggle with it. And as you've said, when, when mm-hmm. anyone is overthinking, I don't think they were thinking positive things. We always spiral into the negative side. And I think that self-awareness that... You has been um, a wonderful thing because at least now you're aware, you know what is happening and you know how to mm-hmm. uh, be in the moment with it and to, and to apply that self-compassion, to go like, mm-hmm. I, I, I am doing my best with what I have right now. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. I will forgive myself if I make a mistake. I will forgive exactly. myself if I say something wrong because I am a human being and I am designed, I am designed to be imperfect. Mm-hmm. Nothing mm-hmm. about me is, was created to be perfect. So just that self-compassion and knowing that imperfection goes with being human is, uh, mm-hmm. I think, is an important piece of the puzzle. Um, what, what, has been, what has been your experience with personal therapy? Uh, again, I'm going to say something that I always say in every live recording that it is my firm belief very strong opinion, very strongly held that every therapist, mental health professional should not be practicing when they have not been on the other side of the couch as a client. So mm-hmm. I don't know about you. Uh, have you been to therapy? And if you have been, what has been the experience? If you have not, uh, what, what, what is your reason? Um, yeah, something along there. <laughs> I have gone for personal therapy. I did personal therapy when I did my undergraduate. I also did personal therapy when I was doing my master's. And when I look back right now, I don't know. I was the, I, I highly doubt I was the best client. And <laughs> oh my god! I remember during my undergraduate, I I had to see two 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 therapists. The first one. I thought she was very boring. And every time I go to that session, I'm like, okay, I'm just doing this to get my 10 hours and I'm out of this place. I never said it. Like I never vocalized it, but it's just something that was within me. I didn't take, let me just say, I didn't take that ses- those sessions very serious. I was doing them as a requirement. Not long after I had just, I was, I, I was having that thought so many times. And then I remember going for my fifth session and then I found another therapist. And I was so disappointed. While I kept on thinking this one is boring, it would have been nice if they had changed to, it, it, I mean, you'd expect that I'd be happy that I've gotten someone else. And when she introduced herself, she told me, my name is so-and-so, I am, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll continue with your sessions because so-and-so is no longer available. And I remember snapping and I told her, why didn't she tell me that she's leaving? I, re- I, I snapped, I was so mad, and I, I couldn't even have that session. And I kept on asking myself much later in life, why, why, why did I feel that way? And, and I actually didn't even enjoy my sessions with her. So that was my experience when I was doing my 10 hours of undergraduate. Up to now, honestly, I cannot tell you, I, I got to that point where I answered that question to myself that why did I snap when she left? But I also think it's because I had already disclosed a lot of things and I know counseling is a process and I kept on feeling now and have to start seeing things afresh. I, I, I mean, that was really disappointing. Come my master's degree when I was, we were supposed to do 24, 25 hours of therapy. <laughs> I literally got three therapists and not out of my choice again. Now this time, I mean, I started with one. She was really, really nice because someone referred me and I had so many sessions with her. We were really having and good, having a good time together in session. There's so much she could relate with. And so I was enjoying my sessions. I was looking forward to go and just pour out my heart and say everything I needed to see. So after like seven sessions, she had to leave. But the good thing is she explained that to me and she handed me over to someone who she, she thought was really she, she thought was really nice. So whoever she handed me over, somehow she was not able to start my session. And then she actually gave me another person. So by the time I was going to this one, I was already so pissed. I think I was closed, totally closed. And so <laughs> I was really hard. I was really hard on this therapist. Looking back, I wish I could take the words I told her. I remember one day I told her, you seem like you just come for therapy for gossip. I literally told her that because I, I think I was going through a process of something and then she kept on telling me something like, eh, so tell me what happened. And I'm like, eh? 
it's like you come in to just it's like i felt like we are seated here to gossip about something and when i told her that was the end of our session and then the one who had been referred to now came back into the picture and that's how i finished my 25 hours of of practice of of personal therapy and and looking back i'm trying to think i should have been probably more i'm very blunt like i can say things that are very hurtful sometimes that's one thing about me while i'm a therapist when i'm in therapy i think i'm a totally different person but when i feel like something of mine is being um well i feel like i'm treated i'm being treated in a way that i think i don't think is right i sometimes do not know how to sugarcoat when i look back i feel like that was not really really nice i should have figured out a better way of saying this me being a therapist right now i've experienced those which i have learned not to take personal i don't know how how my therapists were taking what i told them i have even experienced rejection you know someone would come in in a session and they'll say ah oh, it's you it's a lady no i want a man i don't want to talk to women like something like that and so i've also experienced something like that but uh, being a therapist is it's one thing that makes you, you learn how to take not to take things personal like for me i i know everyone has a choice that they can make a choice they can decide whoever they want to see because this is a process that requires a lot of trusting there has to be rapport and if there's no rapport there's no way you're going to even help or have impact on on, a, on any on any client so honestly i wish i knew what my therapist thought about me with all those weird statements but i i believe they were that got into that point where they they don't take things to heart or take offense <laughs> that is such that is such a comical story about your therapy sessions because yeah. oh my gosh um i'm very curious about uh, and it has brought up so many questions that i want to follow up with and i don't even know if we'll get to all of them but the first one is actually way back in the very beginning when you mentioned the first counselor that you had and she was boring and all these things and you still persevered for five sessions and mm-hmm. i'm wondering um first of all what what uh what 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 do you think makes clients now that you're a therapist what do you think mm. makes clients a via what 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 stopped you from telling your therapist what you are feeling <laughs> at that time about your experience because we keep adv- advising clients to be honest with us we keep advising mm. our, 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 ourselves to be honest with our clients so i'm curious about what do you think kept you from being honest with your therapist and uh, and staying so long when you knew you were not getting what you needed but still persevered and spent your money the entire uh, that entire time let's start with that question as we go on with the other questions i don't know i think a lot of things were going around my mind i kept on asking myself so is this how therapy is supposed to be you remember that was the first time i was sitting in a therapy session you know i had nothing to compare so for me i think it's just that thought maybe this is how the, well i felt like it was boring I kept on telling maybe this is how things are in therapy it's supposed to be like this and I used to ask myself so is this what I am going to become this boring person who would sit down and 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 just and I don't know I kept on asking myself that question because I persevered because I, honestly I didn't have anything else to look at and say this one is boring and this one is a better counselor and so for me that was the first counselor I was actually meeting and 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 I mean I know probably they even clients who look at me and think I'm boring which is okay but probably that's what kept me there like maybe this is how therapy is maybe it's supposed to be like this maybe 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 and so I just kept on going and going and going and of course remember I've done five sessions by the time you've done five sessions with a client they have literally literally opened up their hearts and 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 they've told you so much and the thought of starting the same process to another person was really not it was 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 the hardest thing i was ready to keep up with this one with the hope that yeah this is probably the personality or something and and maybe maybe i get help and so i didn't want to start a, a process again the same process of you know by the time i open up my heart and told you everything i mean i do not want to start telling like everyone everything I've, i have just said so that was why i kept on sticking there this was the first experience with counseling and i was really so scared i was like oh my god so this is what i will become while i loved what i did i was i, I thought I, i had never sat down with a client you know that was my first time 
being sitting as a client and so i started imagining myself as a therapist I was like okay there's no room even for a joke like everything is so straight and and i was like i don't want this it has to be different like when i do my counseling sessions i am never that serious like we can talk about anything we can joke in the session because if there's room for that you know depending on what you are we're dealing with and so and depending on the clients so i want them not to come out of that room um feeling like they have wasted their whole hour with someone who is just there like you know I, i i actually from that experience i i told myself that i will strive to make it a, a session that's also interesting in some sort of way you don't have even if you're crying i'd love that you smile at some point they have to be humor in there that is that is uh, that is so that is so fantastic to hear because um I'm thinking it's literally the reason why I keep saying it's one of the reasons that I keep saying mental health professionals need to go for therapy because mm. that experience teaches you it's a learning it's a learning situation it's a place where you go to learn you, yes you will get to handle the things that um, have your the burdens you've been carrying your entire life but it's also mm. a very wonderful learning experience going for therapy mm. and being a client because you get to learn what makes clients comfortable what makes clients uh, close up what makes clients open up what kind of personalities um uh, when when two different personalities meet what is the easiest way to make both of those personalities feel comfortable together and and i i think um i i would want to hear what your message would be right now to anybody who is about to go to therapy this is their first time they are mm. going to therapy they've never done this before and 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 you don't want them to go through the experience that you went through what would be your advice to them for me uh, uh, number one i would say you're going for, it's like it's like you know okay let me not equate it to that but i would say this um you have a right to change a therapist if you come to gladwell and you're thinking uh uh-uh, it's not working this is not working there's no rapport uh, i don't think i'll get because when that happens you you sort of you already block yourself and it becomes very difficult for a therapist to 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 help you and it's also hard for you to open up you have a choice there there's a, a there's so many therapists out there you can always just decide um this has been real let me try someone else i mean you want to see value for your money at the end of the day and value can come in different even if it just means having something interesting in a in a counseling session and if that will make you feel like this is value for my money then that's good enough so that's one number two i would uh, advise them that uh, counseling is a process while in 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 a first counseling session we both actually are just new to each other and one cannot come for a counseling session the first day and i'm there making jokes i have no idea what brought them to session we have to get to know each other so give it time give it time you may come to gladwell or jennifer or whoever and you, you the first day you're feeling like no 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 this is not working i would say that is premature to decide or to make a decision to leave give it time and see because you're you're literally strangers like you don't know each other while this other is a professional they're also human it takes a bit of time to get to connect even therapist get take time to connect sometimes with like it's not like an instant connection and so give it time and and then you'll decide after you've given it time and if you you're already doubting from the word go on usually even when people come for therapy they don't just start saying everything from their heart the first sessions you like really trying to gauge this one and thinking just the way the therapist is also trying to understand you and know which direction the conversation will take is the same way the client is also would rarely just come to session and start like very few clients would just pour their hearts the first day it takes a bit of time so then just do your assessment do you think they match up to what you think you needed and then you can make a decision afterwards no quitting prematurely and i think that's among the reasons why i could i couldn't leave you know I'm one of those people who always give a benefit of doubt like I meet you today I'm thinking okay maybe not but then I would want to at least give you a fair chance of time to me to finally make a decision about should I continue with you or should I turn and decide on something else I think that's a that's a wonderful message to anybody who's listening and I'm sure um if you're listening that 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 is something that you should pay attention to um and and to add on top of that um i would want to to add 
everybody, if you're going for therapy for the first time, it is okay for you to advocate for yourself. It is okay for you to ask for what you need. Um, mm-hmm. Therapy looks different. There are many different types of therapy. There are many different types of therapists. And if you feel like the thing that you're being offered is not working for you, it is okay to speak about it with your counselor. It's okay to be mm-hmm. like, um, I need you to give me a bit of feedback on this thing, not just listen. Or sometimes you can be like, I need you to listen to me for a while before we start exploring some options on how I can solve the problem. So it's okay mm-hmm. to advocate for yourself. Uh, you don't have to sit through things that don't um, serve you. Your, your, your therapist will not be angry at you for, for advocating for yourself. So I think that is an important message. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Gladry, for bringing it up. The other thing I'm curious about your story is um, the gossip part. Uh, <laughs> and that ties very closely to the reason for being a therapist. So I like asking my, my guests every time to tell us, yes, you are doing the work of being a therapist and, and, and you, you've studied for it you enjoy doing it, but at the end of the day, there must there, there are other things you could be doing with the same skills. There are other things that you could be doing to do the exact same job you're doing, but you chose to be a therapist. So I always want to know the why behind why you do the work that you do. And tied to that is the gossip question. Do you think <laughs> there are therapists who go into therapy because it is a more ethical way of gossiping? I don't know. <laughs> Question. I've never even thought about it. <laughs> yeah. But honestly, I don't know if I can answer that very uh, objectively because um, I don't know. But I am, I, if because I've never been into a therapy, I don't know what they do. But I also think there has to be people who just want, therapists who just want you continue with something that goes, it sort of, it sounds. Uh, for me to have called that gossip, there's a way it was coming. You know, there's a question you, someone would ask you and you're like, this is, are you just asking me this to feed your curiosity or to help me? And even after you say whatever you wanted to say, you feel like, so what did you do with that information? And sometimes you feel like, uh, for me, I would, uh, in, in my case, I used to feel like you just want, you're curious just to know what happened in my life after yesterday, you know, which is a good thing. Because, I mean, it's continual. Like, we'll always continue from where we left. But for me, I'm, I'm specific about this thing because I do not want to disclose what you're having in that session. But the way the questioning came about, it was just curiosity and it, it came almost like gossip to me. So I want to believe uh, probably there are therapists who would want just that. But I don't know. I, I can never be objective answering this question, really. Now, about myself and becoming a therapist. Why? remember my story of how I got to become, to do this course. I think um, I remembered my years as, as, a, as a teenager. And this is where even my passion came from. And I know the struggles of teenagehood. I know the teenagers, of t- today teenagers, the kind of struggles they're going through is not like what we went through as teenagers. And some of the things that uh, got into me even as a teenager, I think if I, if I had someone to talk to and, and someone just to listen to me, I would probably be a different person. And that's why I have this heart for teenagers. And, um, and, and I wanted to specifically, not even to help people out there, my mind was in my kids, my children. I was like, I need to be that person who will be able to understand them. Probably never become a perfect parent, but just to understand my people, my children as they grow. There's so many things that I wanted to know about my family, you know, and there's so much that I also wanted to know about myself. I wanted to be that person who can go out there and help people based on experience and also based on, I mean, yes, I'll have the knowledge is good, but also just the fact that I have the experience to, 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 to do so. And, and that is why my passion, my, 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 my passion, my, my why is just the fact that I needed to help people who are in distress. It actually felt so bad. It, it feels so good for me when I see that someone is making progress. And for me, progress has never been like that big thing. It can be just one step towards the, the direction that someone desires. And that's good enough for me because I know this is a process. It will take um, a some good amount of time and we are doing this step by step and so it's just that I mean 
and and i mean i also just wanted to have a connection you know i can't i i know this is a, a question that i know people will always okay i i hear this answer so many times which is of course uh, valid it's love for people but i don't want to say for me it is really like because i love people because honestly speaking it's not that i don't love people but i am not that outward anyone will tell you that i'm not that all over the place with people but i think i am very empathetic and i just love when i see someone making progress towards the the right direction i hate to see that someone is really struggling and me having the resources and the knowledge to help them really just makes me feel good about this profession and i enjoy doing what i'm doing the one thing that makes me so happy is how honest you are and how self aware you are it just makes it is just so refreshing you have no idea um so thank you thank you so much for saying that there actually <laughs> thank when you. you spoke about uh, when you spoke about the 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 what's the thing uh the gossip part it's because i once listened to somebody who was complaining about her husband that her husband became a therapist because he really really loves gossip and he can just he just can't stop it <laughs> and so it was she was like I I pity my 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 my, my 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 husband's clients. I I don't know if they are aware that they they are feeding his gossip behavior because they're just his gossip buddies. And and I think um the other thing is uh there's something that I wrote in my book. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if some of our audience has has read my book uh, on on the on on the on the um the beginner therapist the things that beginner mm-hmm. therapist needs need to know. And I will in one of the points that I spoke about was that um the reason why you you find um you find counselors of uh, of or trying to get those juicy details of their clients lives sometimes it's because of counter transference sometimes mm-hmm. they have not dealt with their own issues and maybe they have not dealt with their own need for their own loneliness say they don't have friends they don't have places where they can have healthy conversations that feed their soul and so they live for the, the, the scraps of being wanted and being known and being seen by their clients so they feed their own needs by listen by 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 uh trying to get the juiciest stories they can get from their clients and so i think it's a, it's a thing that therapists need to look out for don't be a nosy therapist it's okay to ask questions but remember your client is your client and you're seeing them for a very small period of time in their life mm-hmm. you're not you're not the center of their life so therapists out mm-hmm. there please <laughs> that's a big one for you Thank you so much Nilan for being so honest um and for being so open and and telling us everything that you're doing it's very amazing i want to read a few comments that have been put in the section by in the comment section by our audience uh biko biko roit i don't know if that's how to pronounce it biko mm-hmm. roit uh congratulations gladwell i am proud of you having walked the journey with you for a long time so mm-hmm. they are very happy that you are they're saying con- congratulations to you Uh okay. Flourish Kenya thank you so much for joining the session Ma, huh? Marwa Marwa 20 I don't know how to pronounce your name but thank you for joining the session I'm really happy that you're here Uh Alukwe says being a counselor needs one to be a good listener and for the years I've known Gladwell she's a really good listener counseling is perfect for you so again more praise for Gladwell I'm very really happy that uh, <laughs> that that people are, are really touched by your story and for and the work that you're doing. Um thank you. I am looking at a question here that I have not asked you that I think is very important and one of them is you you've mentioned that there's a time you 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 found yourself working with almost 400 clients and and uh, like cumulatively of course not in one session and um those are many clients and I I'm also uh, putting this combined with other clients you've seen since 2013. What what do you mm-hmm. think is the biggest lesson you've learned from them because um I know I I keep saying that we we learn we every day as a counselor you learn but you don't only learn from the books that you read you don't only learn from fellow counselors you also learn from your clients and they teach you things about life about being a human about about your job as a counselor they teach you so many things so for you what has been the lesson you've learned from your clients during the duration you've been uh practicing as a therapist Mhm I think number one thing I can say is I have learned patience. In the sense that um if 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 ever been and a uh, counselor here will, will probably agree with me. For you to be a therapist, you need to be okay, we, okay, so you know sometimes the way we can describe ourselves that I'm a patient person. But I think when it comes to a therapist, you need 
double of that. Like the patience you require even to work with your clients is a lot. Uh, and, and this is something I can say, I've always been a patient person, but I think with, with, my, with my clients, I have learned to be even more patient. The kind of patience that I display, I always look back and say, did I just sit in a session for two hours and listen to someone who has come with a story from 1963, you know? And, and, and I, I have found that I can calmly sit in a session and listen and listen and listen and listen. And I found that I have improved in many areas of my life, just being a counselor, you know. It does not come, some things are, are natural, but you know, when it comes to it being a profession, you see how, how you've really improved in certain areas of your life. And for me, that area of patience is, is, is actually key. Someone said I'm a good listener. I've always been, but I just didn't know how much I can actually listen to people's stories and people in distress. I, and and I, 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 I bet I can literally just sit down and listen to literally anything that a, a, a client will bring to me without judgment. And um, and that is something I learned. I, shouldn't, I cannot say right now that I was not judgmental before. But right now, I, before even I, 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 I think about someone, before I even say, okay, this one is this way and that way, I have must actually have something to back up what I'm saying. And then that is one thing. Patience was not one of my, my I was patient, but not patient to a certain point. Just like all of us, we are patient to a certain point, and then you can explode at one point. But I realized that now I can actually be patient for a very, very long time. Um, another thing I have gotten from my clients is actually, you know, the way sometimes a client would come into session and they start their story and I'm literally seeing myself in them. You know, I am seeing myself, this, the things that will tell me, this is what is happening. Uh, and I'm thinking that that was exactly me many years ago, you know, and for me in that way, it just gives me, um, it makes me know how much counseling or my profession has helped me to get to where I am now, you know, in various areas of my life. Because, and also just gives me hope that this it's it's uh, it's possible. It helps me look back, you know, look back from then now how things have changed in my life. Because I have had people who come to me like teenagers and all that. They will talk about anxiety. They will say the, the kind of things they can't do, what they can't do, where they can't go, who, why do, why they feel that way. And I'm looking at them I'm like, that was exactly when I was your age. And for me to say that now, it, 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 at that moment, to tell myself something like that, it clearly shows how working as a therapist has literally helped me improve so many things in my life. And so, and that is one of those things that make me enjoy do, doing therapy, you know, because while it may just look that it's for the client, but it's not really, really for the client. It's also for therapists, you know, you're helping someone, but in the process, even you, you're getting some sort of help with things that you've actually struggled with. And, you know, yeah, for me, that is, I mean, you asked the biggest lesson. I don't know if I diverted from your question, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> no you've, you've answered it perfectly you've answered it so perfectly and and there's something that i need to just point out right now is that even for anybody listening right now i'm sure they can tell that um you have really deep empathy for mm. people and for the work that uh, and in the work that you do uh, you, you, we, your understanding of your clients and the, their needs it just mm. yeah it oozes from the way you speak mm. it's mm. very easy to tell that you have empathy for your clients and i think that is one of the most important characteristics for any counselor if you don't have empathy for your clients if you lose your compassion for your clients you're going to start seeing them as resistant as annoying as all those negative things but that is when you've lost your compassion and your empathy that you start to see those things but realizing that we're all human Mm -hmm. and we all struggle and the yeah. only differentiator between us and our clients is that at least we have a bit of knowledge on some of these mm. things or we have spent some more time on specific knowledge for us to take care of ourselves so thank you you've answered really beautifully you've answered it really well um i don't know if um i don't know i don't know what what your advice would be for people who are listening who might not um who might not have any access to mental health services right now actually mm. no this one is for people 
in general about mental health what what mm. would you what what would be your message for them what do you wish they knew more about mental health in general so that they mm. could benefit from therapy sessions they could benefit from self development courses and all those things what do you wish that people knew more about mental health and especially kenyans because i think it's unique to kenyans yes exactly the other day i was in a uh, in a in a in a group session and i remember this this guy standing up and telling me um africans we don't suffer from depression that was this, that was the exact thing he said and, and and i was there thinking why do you think we don't suffer from depression it's like no 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 why that is not our sickness that is for for, for mzungus that's what he said i was like ah okay and and i i just clearly shows how there are people who still don't consider mental health like the way they consider other other things and and for me what i want to tell people is the way you take care of your physical health the same energy you'd put on your physical health if if today you 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 have a headache and 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 it's not going away the first thing is like oh um let me take panadol or if it's not stopping you want to go see a doctor but then when you feel like you're overwhelmed something is just not right and you can't put a finger on it it's something that has to do with your mental people don't quickly rush to go and see someone a psychologist even a psychiatrist depending you know but when it comes to mental illness we are quick we are fast we want to see a doctor we want to take sick of we want to you know i can't wake up today this is like this and this you know so the 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 energy that you give your physical health also give it to your mental health you know this is very important because these two things are correlated you know the way we keep saying there's no physical health or there's no mental there's no mental health without physical health or there's no even physical health without mental health. they are like just you know they're like two things in one and so things like depression are not it's myths you know there's so much myth surrounding mental health and even mental illness that prevents people from seeking help and 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 that can also come from um uh, from from what society upbringing or just you know what what people have come to believe for many years and and you re- you find that people are literally suffering and they, they i don't know they they have no idea that they can actually just go to someone who can help them through their issues they can process what's happening in their life and that will be better and does not even necessarily mean that they have to go and see a therapist you know there are certain things you can search about what you're feeling and it can actually help you towards a better mental health mm-hmm. and so my uh, my my w- the one word i would give them just mm-hmm. the same energy you apply on your physical health put it on your mental health they are both key they are important and they correlate that is very true and and i like it because um the existing keeps saying mind and body as if they are two separate things and i think mm-hmm. that's the separation of the mind and body is what makes people think that uh, my mental health care is on one side and my physical health is on another side mind mm-hmm. and body um is literally the the mind is a part of the body it is it is one thing they are just two different parts of mm-hmm. the body so that does not mean that they are separate that does not mean that one is greater than the other they are just two different parts of mm-hmm. the body but the same body and so if you're dealing with mm-hmm. mental illness or mental health challenges they are going to affect you physically if you're dealing with some physical mm-hmm. challenges they're going to affect you mentally to a degree and that's why it's it's supposed to be a holistic approach and i think that is a really good segue into into diving into self care a bit um what is your take on self care and uh, and what are your self care practices that you do for yourself on a on a daily basis to keep yourself afloat nairobi is a difficult city to live in Kenya is a difficult country to live in. Africa is a difficult continent to live in um for some people. So uh for for those of us who are suffering, what is a self care mm. routine that you practice that you think would be beneficial to us and uh, to to me listeners and everybody? <laughs> well, that's a question that I will have to probably lie if I I, I say it very gen- what exactly if I, I I if I have to answer it in a way that will help people. I'll have to literally lie. but i'm going to be as genuine let's, as um, possible let's let, let's let's start with, with the one where you tell us the truth which is about yourself and then you can tell us about in general what you think is applicable <laughs> self care is important in all professions actually and 
where I, I'm saying what I'll say, you know, the way sometimes this saying that says you preaching water and taking wine. And you've also said people saying that doctors are the worst uh, patients, something like that. Self-care, well, I know the importance of self-care. And and I once in a while, that's why I want to, I, I'm saying it this way because I know it's not something I do consist as much as I should do considering my profession. But my way of self-care, I will take time for myself because I know my profession involves listening and, and, and just um, and talking sometimes. And so for someone who is not practicing counseling, they would not know how mentally draining that can be. Like sitting down on a day and listening to people with distress from eight to five or the biggest chunk of your time in the day. And so for me, sometimes I'll just want to be go somewhere I probably get uh, my favorite restaurant. I go there, sit there by myself, enjoy a meal or take a drink. And I would purpose to do that maybe for just an hour or two where I'm just silent. I don't have to be listening to anyone, not because I don't want, not because I don't like, but I just want to be there with myself. You know, it's very easy to forget about yourself in, in this profession. And even when you go back home, sometimes you'll even find that you're thinking about your clients. They keep popping, popping, popping in your head. But now it's a conscious decision to say, this is my time now. I'm going to think about myself. I'm going to take up care of myself. I also go for massages. That is something that I always put in my planner that I'll do monthly, but I hardly do that monthly. But I purpose to do that at least when I feel, again, this profession involves sitting for long hours. And so that may not be good for physical health. And so I would have to book for a massage. And that's one of my self-care. Another one that is very, that's one that I can practice almost on a weekly day, day basis. This might sound like not self-care for someone else, but for me, this is really good. I will take long showers. And, and I will just, and as the shower goes down on me, I'm thinking, let me just release everything. Oh my, you know, you're tired, your shoulders, the stiffness and all that. And after that, I'll feel really good. And that, that is self-care. Of course, for me, I've always known self-care as something that doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to spend so much money for you to feel like you, 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 you get in self-care. So it's good to have a variety. When you have the cash, you can, uh, you can splurge. When you don't have, it's not like you shouldn't get self-care for yourself. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's, that's an important aspect, especially what you've just said, that it doesn't have to be expensive. And I think also um, that it's important to, to de deter, uh, what's, what's the thing? Detach self-care from money. It's not always about money. Uh, self-care is you making yourself a good meal. Self-care is you saying no when you need to say no. Saying yes when you need to say yes. Self-care is you um, hanging out with friends when you need to hang out with friends. Self-care is you forcing yourself to hang out with friends because you know if you continue staying indoors alone, it's going to affect your mental health. That is self-care. Mm -hmm. Self-care is you mm -hmm. reading a book. Self-care is you um, going to sleep early because you know tomorrow you have an early morning and instead of sitting up and scrolling Instagram till the end of the night. Self-care is mm -hmm. you um, waking up early preparing yourself in advance so that when you give yourself ample time to get to work or to whatever commitment you're going to. Self-care is not mm -hmm. always about spending. So I think it's important for our audience to understand that self-care is not always about you buying things or spending money. Anybody can practice self-care. And again, another thing I keep saying is that self-care is not an emergency response. It is not the thing that you do when you burn out. Self-care is the mm -hmm. thing you do so that you don't burn out. It is the thing you do on a daily basis. It's mm -hmm. the thing that you do to take care of yourself because it is more of a prevention strategy than it is an emergency response. If you try to use self-care as an emergency response, it won't work. And then you will come back and tell us, you people advocated for self-care and it didn't work. It's because you used it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> self-care is not an emergency response. Please, let's, let's, let's be aware that self-care is not an emergency response. So thank you very much, Gladwell, for sharing that. Um, before we, we are coming very close to the end of this uh, live. And before we do that, I want to read a few more comments that have been put in this comment section. Uh, the first one being from Akulukwe, who says, I am just wondering, apart from going for counseling sessions as a requirement to gain a degree or master's, is it important for professional counselors to go for counseling from time to time? Um, Gladys, do you want to respond before I go? Yeah, yeah, it is a requirement. 
because we have something it's still we still call it personal therapy i believe so even as you work because remember you in a helping profession and and every day you're going through so much and so counselors also have their own their own sessions like there's a plan session with, with what do we call it jennifer i've forgotten the name um the the there's actually what what I was going to go for was uh, both supervision and therapy personal therapy Sa- separating separating mm. uh, two mm. of those so i don't know you can continue and then i can just jump yeah. on it it was supervision 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 you go to present sometimes you, you go to present cases that you're struggling with uh, maybe they're too heavy for you and so you need people who've been in the field for quite a long time to help you navigate through that and 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 help you to go through your counseling process and then personal yeah. therapy now when the issues you've been getting in therapy are probably beginning to affect you and so you go for personal yeah. therapy you go disclose for other therapists also so they help you through that process and so it makes you a better counselor it's actually a requirement that all counselors need to go for supervision and also go for personal therapy even as they are working as professionals yeah um i was going to say thank you for for sharing that and i was going to say um alukwe i think i'm yes i'm um, pronouncing your name correctly so alukwe the other part of this is that different for example uh, different countries have different requirements i know for example like um i think in the uk once you've practiced for about you've had sessions it does not matter in what duration of time as long as maybe you've gone for about let's say 20 sessions let's say you've had 20 hours of one on one therapy with clients or group therapy or whatever in some countries they will require you after those 20 hours of practice you have to go for personal therapy it does not matter whether you feel like you need it or not you just have to go for personal therapy because they believe mm. after those hours that you've been spending with clients you will need some place to go and release that tension you will need some place to go and release that energy that you've been carrying and to have somebody to talk to, to talk to about the things that you're going through and remember the things that your clients talk to you about those things also affect you because you're a human being just because you are educated and you're smart and you've sat in class for five years gotten your degree and everything does not does not uh make you immune to human emotions if your client comes to you when they're depressed and they're struggling with such a deep depression that they they are unable to get out of bed they cannot do the daily functions of their life and you see five of those clients at some point that energy is going to get to you because you're a human being not because you're a bad counselor so in some countries they will require you after you've practiced for x amount of hours they will they will uh, clarify for you they'll tell you how many hours you're supposed to practice so that you can go for individual sessions um the other part is what uh, uh, is what Gladwell mentioned about supervision so supervision uh, there are two types of supervision there's clean uh, there's a uh, one on one supervision and there is peer supervision peer supervision is between you and your peers so your fellow counselors uh, maybe people you went to school with and you guys have a group where you guys talk about uh, the challenges that you're going through with individual clients maybe there's a case that you had that was very uh, difficult you didn't know how to proceed and so you're looking for their advice on how they would handle that particular case and they can also shed light on some things that you might not be seeing because you're too close to the client because you're the one working with the client so that is peer supervision mm-hmm. and the other type of supervision is one on one supervision with a supervisor so with a clinical supervisor you're going there because this clinical supervisor is going to help you do the same thing understand the client understand the case you're doing understand some aspects of the profession that are difficult to understand maybe you you're just a beginner and there's something you don't understand about the profession the best person to ask is somebody who has been there for long and that's most likely a clinical supervisor or a peer supervisor so mm-hmm. if you want to hear from your fellow colleagues you're going to go to a peer to peer supervisor if you want mm-hmm. to hear from somebody who's a bit superior in the sense that um they have practiced longer not because they are older than you not because they have a better job than you not because they earn more money than you it is because they have practiced longer than you that is what makes them a better supervisor and also they have been trained in clinical supervision there's a course that is called clinical supervision that people go and take and in clinical supervision you're taught how to supervise people when they have difficult cases so those are the two aspects that say um there's something i want to mention about going for personal therapy and that is um i remember I was reading something that freud said about personal therapy and he was saying that 
every therapist must go for personal therapy after about five sessions. <laughs> that is, I think that is what he said, if I'm not wrong. Because yeah. for him, he felt that uh, the work of being a therapist is not the easiest job on the planet. And it can mess up with you. Remember, I think being a therapist, and Gladwell, you can agree with me on this. Being mm -hmm. a therapist, you, you don't, it's not like in those other professions where if you come home and you've had such difficult cases, you can't sit with your, uh, with your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, or even your kids, your grown kids, and sit there with them and tell them, "Why? Well, let me tell you this client I had today. That mm -hmm. is not that is not something you can do. Because if, can... for example, you have a shop or you work in a supermarket, you're a cashier, you can go home and tell your your, your mm -hmm. people, hey, by the way, today I had this client, and all these things. Mm -hmm. But then when it's a therapy, when you when you're a therapist, you don't get to discuss the the inner workings of your job. You don't yeah. get to let off that steam on a daily basis to regular people. You have to go to somebody who understands the profession. Because yes. it's very easy to break confidentiality. So mm -hmm. that is the other thing I would say. You need personal therapy. It helps you a lot, especially when you go through difficult things. You are most vulnerable to hurt your clients if you have gone through something difficult recently and you have not gone for personal therapy. So mm -hmm. for example, if you have just lost a loved one, if you have just been fired from your job, if you have just uh, been evicted from your house, if you have just, maybe your mortgage has not gone through, and it is something that is weighing very heavily on you, you're likely to hurt your clients. And you will not hurt them physically, you will hurt them emotionally, because when you go to therapy, you will not be meeting the client's needs. You'll be there to meet your own needs. You'll be trying mm -hmm. to control the session, you'll be trying to tell your clients what to do, you'll, be try you'll get frustrated with your clients. There'll be a lot of things happening, because there are problems happening in your life. So, mm -hmm. Go for personal therapy, especially when you have gone through something difficult recently. That is when you're most vulnerable. But ordinarily, I would advise for regular therapy sessions for therapists. Even after you've graduated, even after you've been practicing for, practicing for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years, go for personal therapy. Gladwell, do you want to add anything to that? You've literally said everything. I mean, uh -huh. it's, it's very clear. <laughs> oh, okay, fantastic. Okay. I can see Alukwe gives a thumbs up. I am assuming that means that we have answered your question adequately. If we have not, you can you can add any other thing uh, into the comment section. Uh, Flourish Kenya says, I am proud of my friend and colleague. You reminded me of my experience in personal therapy. Uh, Gladwell, I am, I'm sure that is you the, 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 that uh, mm -hmm. Flourish Kenya is talking about. Um, uh, let me recognize, let me recognize, let me recognize one more person who is who has just joined our life. Ivana Waweru is here with us. Ivana was our guest from last week's session. If you've not watched that session of Know the Therapist, please go watch it and listen to Ivana, the kind of work she does. Uh, she has a wonderful story about working with teenagers and especially um, uh, uh, working with teens who have just become moms. Uh, she gave us a very, very wonderful conversation last week and that was epic. So thank you, Ivana, for joining us today. So, glad we are coming mm -hmm. to a very close end of this session and I don't want to keep you too long. I have mm -hmm. two final questions. I have actually one final question and one final mm -hmm. point that you can give us. So my final okay. question is, um, there could be somebody who's listening right now and, and uh, they don't have access to a therapist or they don't mm -hmm. have the money, they don't have, maybe they live in a remote part of Kenya where there are mm -hmm. no therapists, they do not have access to a counselor right now. And because of that, uh, they want to accumulate the things I call therapeutic aids, things that can... Mm -hmm help them, uh, support them in the duration of, of uh, in, in this period of time when they do not have a counselor. I don't know if you have any specific resources you would recommend for them to check out and, and to keep their mental health in check even before they find a counselor for themselves anytime soon. Okay, that's, that's a good one. I think resources, let me start with res okay, a resource. It's, there's one resource that I I also check every so often there's a youtube channel called therapy in a nutshell and there's a very fantastic lady there who can help you through a lot you just need to research on her and and find what she'll talk about a lot a lot of mental illness anxiety uh, it, it not necessarily mental illness but just psychosocial issues and also mental issues mental illness related issues and for me i find a lot of resource from her she's uh, the, the channel is called therapy in a nutshell Another place I would refer is churches. I mean, churches nowadays have actually professional counselors. One specific church I can say is Sitam. 
if you go if you Nairobi that is if you Nairobi you can go to Sitam Valley Road they they actually offer counseling services and they do not they do not charge and any other church i believe the many churches nowadays have recognized the importance of mental health and and if you just walk into a church and ask if they offer counseling services you're likely to find one another thing i always tell people is that um you want counseling services you're going through something you know very well you don't have money and 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 you really want professional services walk into a counseling center and request you can tell them explain yourself it doesn't hurt you know you have to try these things you have to and and i think there's something i was reading another day that you really need to have audacious people in this life because you will never get something unless you you give it just go with all the energy you have and and tell them i i need sessions i'm going through this and this and i don't have money because i have worked in an organization where we would charge clients but then there are people who'd walk in and and and, and would listen to them you know at the end of the day these are counselors these are mental health pr- practitioners they may not do this every day but at least for that specific i don't think you can get into a mental uh, into a counseling center and 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 they leave you or they let you go just like that mm-hmm. you know you will find more resources from them and also that they will at least leave you will leave that place with something you know something to help you push through up to the point where you'll find you you can get to for is for we can get to someone who can help you for instance i i want to believe that any counselor that is here if someone comes into your facility and they're suicidal you will not let them go whether they're going to pay you or not you will at least stabilize them before you refer them to some place so churches are good um try therapy in a nutshell have friends around you can give you support and and even encourage you in certain areas they may not be professionals but they will help you navigate through whatever might be troubling at that point and 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 i mean it's 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 something that you don't have to you don't have to suffer alone you know there are people out there who are willing to help their organizations but uh, you sometimes you just need to do your research but before you do that it's very important just to know that there are places where you can go and get pro bono services uh thank you thank you for sharing that and and to add on to that i want to also mention that um just just um is it three days ago i mm-hmm. i made a video on youtube that has um has a, a, a list of uh therapy services that are offered for free and i mm-hmm. i put there a bunch of helplines that you can call those numbers are, are, are numbers that i called myself and i had them speak and i know that they offer mm-hmm. free counseling services so go on youtube and search for free therapy services in Kenya three free counseling in Kenya you're going to see a video by Safe Space Arena that's my, the youtube channel where i post uh, content about mental health go and look at that video and and if you go to safe space arena uh, the blog you are going to see that i have also shared a list of hospitals that was sent by um nms so nms has three this free mental health services in hospitals and they shared about 30 hospitals that are offering those services they are offering psychiatric services they are offering uh, uh, counseling services they are offering offering clinics and i shared that list as well in my blog i shared it on facebook i shared it on instagram i shared it on, i shared it on twitter go look for um safe space arena that is the platform and i'm going to put that in the in the description box of this video so that you can find those free resources there are so many of them and and I, i also shared a way of finding therapists if you're looking for therapists so go on that youtube channel as well and find those resources they are there we have made them so that you can access them as easily as you can and most of these services are free by the way not every therapy service is being charged so thank you so much for sharing that um gladwell really appreciate it um last but definitely not least um um if somebody is listening to you right now and they're thinking oh my gosh gladwell is amazing i want to work with gladwell i want gladwell to walk me through my journey of mental health how and where can they find you i can actually uh i can give a contact not yet yes. i haven't a yeah it's so that you can just call me and we'll organize a session together so my number is 05 07 25 mm-hmm. 7 726 726 okay 5 1726 yes 
So that is where they call you and they, you guys That's will organize, you'll tell them the charges, you'll tell them mm-hmm. how the location, you'll tell them the schedule and all those good things. Exactly. Ah, fantastic. Awesome. So this has been one of the most amazing conversations I've had on Know the Therapist in a very long time. You are a fantastic therapist. I have met you in person. Um, you, you are a great human being. I've interacted with you and um, I'm very honored that you, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very happy that you honored my invitation to come to know the therapist. And I am very happy that we got to have this chat. I have, I have learned a lot from you. I am sure anybody who has listened has learned a lot from you and not just about mm. therapy, but also about who you are and the way that you do your work. And I think that is something that is always missing when clients are looking for counselors because we are very, we work is in isolation most of the times. It's very hard for clients to know what kind of a therapist is this person? How do they act? How, how are they as a human being? What's their vibe? You know, and mm. this platform offers, offers uh, clients that opportunity. So I'm sure somebody will be listening and they'll be like, Gladwell is the one. And I'm very happy that they will, they will get in touch with you. You're going to put your contact information in the description box of this video. This video is going to go up on YouTube. This video will be on Facebook. This video is going to be here on uh, Instagram. And I cannot wait for everybody to, he- to listen to it. You have been a wonderful guest. Your story is amazing. You are so honest and so open. And I really, really, really appreciate you speaking to me and being so candid with me. I don't take it for granted. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. It was an honor, honestly. I've enjoyed the session with you. I've also gotten a lot. I've learned a lot. And I'm so excited that this happened. I, mean, I was looking forward to this. And I'm, I'm happy that we finally had, we've had this session together. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So with that said, we are going to come to the end of this session. We are going to come to the end of this live. I want to say thank you to all our audience members who participated, who showed up and participated. You could be anywhere mm-hmm. in the world, but you chose to be on a live video with me and Gladwell at 8.30 in the evening on a Thursday night. And I don't take that for granted. So thank you so much for joining us on Know the Therapist. I am inviting you to have a look at the other sessions you have had in the past. Listen to the other guests we have spoken to and, and hear their stories, hear how they work understand the kind of work they do and why they do it. And I also invite you to come back every Thursday. Sometimes it's Wednesday, but often it's Thursdays. Come back every Thursday on this Instagram uh, live, this Instagram page. Mm -hmm. And you're going to hear me having conversations with diverse uh, counselors and uh, clinical psychologists. And you're going to be talking all sub mental health. If you have any questions between now and the next uh, live video that you're going to have, please always send it in the... um, in the, in the DM of this uh, page, or you can send me an email at iwcafrica at gmail.com. You can find all that information on our platform and you can get in touch directly with me. I usually add my, my website in the, in the comment section. You're going to see my contact info. You can get in touch with me and we can speak. If you know anybody looking for a counselor, direct them here. Let them come and find the counselor they're looking for. If you know anybody who's looking to learn more about becoming a counselor, Invite them to come and join these sessions. We would love to feature them on the show. If you know any therapists out there who might be a wonderful guest for us, please let them know to get in touch with us and I would be happy, happy, happy to feature them on this show. So thank you very much for coming to know the therapist. Thank you, Gladwell, for your time. And I wish all of you a wonderful evening and a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. You too have a lovely evening. Thank you, Gladwell. And see ya. Okay, see ya. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.